This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Hi everyone and welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. I'm your host Duncan McLeish, welcome to the show. Up on this episode, we continue our look at our listener choice selection for November. You guys selected Amicus Horror Productions and we're doing a four part series on that. This is instalment number two. Uh, Our previous instalment is the video before this if you're checking us out on YouTube or the episode before if you're listening to us in podcast form. Uh, On this episode, we're doing The House That Drip Blood from 1971. This is on the back half of the overall anthology releases by Amicus and to a lot of people scores very 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 high overall when you're looking at the list as a whole. To me I have a slightly contrarian approach to this one. I think this is one half of a very solid Amicus production and one half of a tonal mismatch that kind of undoes a lot of the hard work the rest of it does. Now I know you probably just spat whatever you were drinking, your coffee is now festooned over your screen and I apologise for that previously. But um, that's just the way I feel and I will back up my views on it after the first break. We are of course uh, still got two episodes to do, so there'll be two more Amicus episodes in the remaining two Mondays in November. Uh, this week you are getting another episode, it's a long wait, it has been recorded for a while, and I'm finally putting it out, we're going to be reviewing The Beyond from 1981 by um, Horror godfather of gore and maggots and all that stuff Lucio Fulci it's the second movie in his Gates of Hell trilogy and that'll be dropping later on in the week so let's get down to it shall we we're going to take a short break you are going to see the trailer for a little movie called The House That Drip Blood and when I return I'll be reviewing that movie for you giving my thoughts and reasons for my opening statement, which left you aghast. And we're going to be doing it right after this. This house is full of sounds. The loudest is your heart pounding in the night. The softest is the sound of terror. He's an old Charles. No, no, please, please. In this house, terror waits for you in every room. Welcome back. So, The House at Drip Blood, 1971. Like I said in the intro, a movie which is kind of well regarded by a lot of um, fans of the genre, a lot of fans of Amicus, and just in general, a lot of people that enjoy a little bit of British horror. 
Um, doesn't hold the lofty status with myself, but each to their own, as they say. I'm but a simple man who has some recording equipment and enough time to record a review on it. You should not take everything I say as gospel, because it's not. It's just one man's opinions. Um, well, let me give you some details on this one, and we will transition with stills from the movie, which will allow me to turn around and read the IMDb. The House That Drip Blood is directed by Peter Duffel. It is based on the story by Robert Block and is, at least one of the shorts is co-written by Russ Jones. The movie itself stars John Bryans, John Bennett, Denham Elliott, Peter Cushion, it's Christopher Lee, Joanna Dunham, Robert Lang, John Pertwee, Ingrid Pitt and various other folk. The synopsis of this one is an anthology of four horror stories revolving around a mysterious house in the UK. So the Lincoln story for this one is that there's a detective from Scotland Yard who is investigating the disappearance of a famous actor who last residence was in this house. Now I always love, always love uh, checking out reviews and things online. Generally in advance of my reviews I kind of like to get a lay of the land. Um, and what I love about reviews of this movie is how many people appear to be incessantly butthurt at the title of the movie. And it's another shining example of Amicus mis-selling a movie based on the title. And you're like, really? <laughs> you know, the, the house doesn't actually drip blood. No, it doesn't. But guess what? Argento's Four Flies in Grey Velvet is not that. Um, Cat and Nine Tales, also not that. Um, guess what? The final chapter in Friday the 13th wasn't the final chapter either. The house with laughing windows didn't actually have windows that cackled. Um, and various other things with the title is mildly misleading. I would say, actually, of all the titles, uh, if you think of something like Dr. Terror's House of Horror, which is set on a train, uh, at least this one kind of links back in. The house is the central location to many grisly and gruesome events involving death, murder and other shenanigans. So you could literally say that the house has blood on its metaphorical hands and thus the house that drip blood is actually not a bad name for the movie overall. So I'm just going to say if that's where your issues start with this one, I don't know how to help you. Because there's other things we can pick at, and we shall. So anyway, this uh, detective from Scotland Yard, he's down in the local police station, he's trying to find this missing actor whose last residence was this house. And as he's chatting to the local fuzz, they start telling him, listen, this house is a bit creepy. Let us tell you about what's happened in this house. And instantly I'm like that. You know what this feels like? This feels like an amicus portmanteau wet dream. Hit me up with your stories. Sell me your sexy wares. And we jump right into story number one, Method of Murder. It stars Denim Elliott, who is a phenomenal presence and actor. You know him as Marcus Brody from the Indiana Jones movies. You probably also know him from... To a Devil a Daughter, um, the kind of movie that really killed <laughs> Hammer Studios. wasn't the one that like put the final dagger in. That had been a long time coming, but you know, I, I put on a pair of steel toe cap boots and made sure that the volley was right in the testicles of that studio. I mean, like you have to really go out your way to sever a relationship, a long-standing relationship behind uh, an author like Dennis Wheatley and poor Christopher Lee. Um, he was so aghast by what they did with his novel, it's unbelievable, and Christopher Lee talked him into licensing it. Um, that's, a, like, that's a 75% of a great movie, like a great bonkers hammer movie, and 25% of a I do not understand what's going on here. There are some artistic choices, including underage nudity, which does not fly, and an ending which on its base level is kind of hilarious you know satanic and evil rights can be always defeated by a bit of stone to the head and I think that's something that we should all live by as a rule of thumb anyway Denim Elliott here is a kind of Stephen King-esque character he's an author um, he is writing a horror story and the central antagonist is a guy called Dominic the Strangler 
which makes him sound like a WWE wrestler. Um, the Strangler is uh, a character that is slowly starting to seep into the psyche of Denim Elliot in real life. And I kind of whistle and I'll come to you. He starts appearing like in the distance and round corners and in his waking moments. In his dreams as well, but more and more in his waking moments. And starts to have an impact on those around him, including his wife, who is at one point attacked by the Strangler. And after Elliot comes into the room, she claims it was actually Elliot that attacked her and not this mysterious mythical character. Um, this all culminates with Elliot himself being bumped off and uh, the Strangler, we I think, is going to take out his wife, only for it to be revealed, and we do spoilers on this one, and the movie's over 50 years old, so if you've not seen it, that's on you, that ain't on me. Plus, we give you a warning on the upfront. Um, it's revealed that the Strangler is actually the lover of Elliot's now widow. And she's like, aha, the plan worked. And he's like, plan? And she's like, yeah, the plan. And he's like, she's like, you didn't kill him though. And she's like, I totally killed him. And she's like, well, that's not what I asked you to do. And he's like, I don't know you. And I'm paraphrasing and changing the dialogue a little bit here. But the upshot is that this character who she thinks is her lover doesn't have any memory of her and maybe he is just in fact Dominic the Strangler and strangles her at the end and that's the end of it. I can have a lot of time for this one. It's short, sharp, snappy. Yes, it feels familiar but it's over 50 years old and I imagine even though the story itself feels like it might be um, taking liberties with other stories out around the time, um, it has a fresh enough and vibrant enough feel in the pacing alone to kind of push this one through. Denim Elliot is brilliant in this. There's a lot of facial expressions of terror and horror and that's enough to sell it for me. He's like a high watermark and yeah, it's not anything remarkable but as an opening portmanteau on an anthology by Amicus, this kind of ticks the brief this is where you want to start and from here you want to be scared more and more and crush with a scary landing a finishing segment that has to be scary wait one second is this foreboding for our final shot yes yes it is dear listener i'm glad that you picked up on that anyway let's move into our second story the second story is waxwork this one has horror royalty as peter cushion uh, a former kind of stockbroker and investment banker guy who under stress has given up that life and moved to the country he seems to be opining after a lost love and this has had an effect on him she kind of haunts him um, in his quiet time and he is out one day decides to go into town and he comes across a wax museum and when he goes in he finds that one of the exhibits is I can never remember the name of the biblical character but John the Baptist's head is on this tree held by this woman and the waxwork figurine of the woman is remarkably rem eerily scarily um, the, 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 the visage of his long lost love and this kind of gets them and meanwhile the owner of the wax museum who is two steps away from twiddling a moustache and should have a giant neon sign behind him saying do not trust this guy likely antagonist of this short um he's walking about and you know he's kind of oh what is thy pleasure you know like all this weird shit um cushion becomes obsessed with this wax figurine and one night he's visited by a former friend um and we find out actually rival for his love uh, who is in the area and he decides to pay him a visit and he stays over and they get drunk and as friends do and in the morning they go out for a walk and he sees the wax museum he's like I want to go in here and Cushion's like let's not do that and he's like I'm going to go in and he sees the same kind of wax figurine and thinks exactly the same thing that Peter Cushion does and becomes obsessed with it as well long story short uh, Cushion eventually ends up back in this wax museum and it is revealed that the owner of the store, creepy moustache twiddling villain guy with the neon sign behind him, uh, was also obsessed with this girl. And so much so that he actually murdered her and encased her in wax and then put her out on display. And then he decides that he's just going to do the same to Peter Cushion. And we get a bit of a scuffle and because this can't have a happy ending because Amicus Yo, um, he kills Peter Cushion 
off screen. Remember, it's off screen. Uh, and the next time we see Cushion, his severed head is now in the place of the John the Baptist face. Um, made it of wax. And I would change the order of this one. I would probably have this as the last story. And the reason I would have it as the last story, notwithstanding the fact that the last story is illy placed, um, Cushion's great in this one. The pacing is off. Uh, for me, you come at a very fast-paced previous story, a method of murder, and they come at this one, and it instantly puts the brakes on and really goes for a kind of slow, methodical ghost story, which I feel would slide easier into after the comedy of the clock. But because of that, I'm left with great performances, an ending which doesn't really satisfy me because I'd seen, you know, House of Wax by then, so I kind of saw this coming. Um... I don't think it's great. I think he's great. I think Peter Cushion's great, but that's like saying the sun is hot. Uh, you know what I mean? It's, that's a given. You show me the Cushion performance that you don't like and I will call you a filthy liar. Um, so that's a bit of a frustration. I think it's place in the anthology kind of knocks it down for me. Um, which is a shame because like I say, it's Peter Cushion and we should just love him. Um... I also think this is in or around the time that Cushion's wife had passed away or she was very ill and as a result of that I like wholly believe his performance, this idea of lost love, is kind of etched on his face. Christopher Lee as his best friend would kind of push him into performances to try and get over that. Um, that's why you see him in things like Horror Express and stuff which is in or around the same time as well. So that's the second um, short uh, Sweets to the Sweet is the third. It stars the aforementioned Christopher Lee. He has rented the house for him and his daughter to get them away from everyone. And he's decided to hire an au pair to kind of basically come in and live in their house and look after his daughter because he wants her to live under relatively strict draconian rules in that she can only read what he approves. She can't meet anyone, anyone else her age. She can't go outside. She can't go to school. Um, and this old pair comes in and she feels for the girl that, you know, Lee's being excessive, demanding and unfair. Which, to be honest with, with you watching this one, that's right. That's how he's behaving. And the audience is kind of lulled into this. He's been a bit excessive and heavy-handed with his daughter. Is he not? But Christopher Lee knows something that we don't. And as this story slowly unfolds, we start to realise that maybe, maybe he's got a point. And that point being that... Her mother, who is no longer with her, um, studied black magic and so does the child because we find paraphernalia and hidden books and all the rest. And she crafted a little wax doll um, that looks like more wax, uh, that looks like Christopher Lee and she's jabbing it with pins, which is affecting him in meetings and all the rest. And it eventually makes him bedridden. And the end of the short is essentially Lee kind of explaining to the op exactly why he's behaved the way he has and the reasons behind it and we need to stop the girl and with that she comes running out of room and the op chases after and they end up in the drawing room beside Chekhov's roaring fire um, and she tries to reach out to the little girl and get her to befriend her again and trust her and the little girl ultimately throws the wax doll onto the fire and we hear blood curdling screams as Christopher Lee is burned off screen very much like Peter Cushion was killed off screen because this is an amicus production and we don't have money for that, right? So they die off screen. And that's the rule. Um, this is kind of cool. I would have this as the second story, if I'm honest. I think this one has a slow enough pace. It's not as slow as Waxworks, but at the same time, has like a great powerhouse performance. A little bit of mystery and intrigue. Yeah, you kind of see where it's going. And that's fine, but... It would work for me as the second short. Uh, I, once again, I don't know why my brain contextualises it that way. All I do know is we then jump into the final short, which is The Cloak. And this one stars John Pertwee and Ingrid Pitt. John Pertwee is the second Doctor from Doctor Who. I say that and I kinda, I'm not a Doctor Who fan. I did grow up watching it, but I can't remember if he's the first or second. I want to say he's the second. And I know all the Who heads, which is people that like Doctor Who, are writing comments. I'm going to say second, and if I'm wrong, 
I'm wrong. A better podcaster and video maker would fact check that, but I am not he and he is not me. Um, so he's a kind of aging actor who's got at that stage of his career that he can only really get gigs in horror movies, which in itself is kind of fun because it's John Pertwee and he's in a horror movie. Um, in fact, he even goes one step further forward. He's playing a vampire in this one and he actually remarks that he'd much rather be doing a kind of Lugosi style vampire and not that new Dracula guy which is obviously a play at Hammer Horror and Christopher Lee and we, you know we're being all very meta and um, he's given a prop cloak to wear as a vampire and he refuses to wear it instead he finds a cloak in a, like an antique shop or something near the house he's renting and he decides it's a cloak he's going to wear but it slowly starts to change him and he starts to take on the characteristics of a vampire um, and even one step further, when the clock strikes 12, he becomes a vampire, which is actually the reveal of the story here, is it turns him into a vampire. This is a comedy, this isn't even a horror, it's really, really weird, because I'm not against comedic elements, um, and anthologies of breaking the ice, but having this one as the last story is baffling. And would maybe only work if the closing of the linking story was super serious, which it isn't, um, it also leans back into the story and takes a comedic turn, which is even more head-scratching. Um, I think it undoes pretty much all the hard work this anthology tries to set up before, and I would have this as the third one, the penultimate uh, one, and then close out with Peter Cushion's one as a way to soberingly bring us back down to something dark. It wouldn't fit with the Lincoln story, but that was the order I would have. Um, Pertwee's vampire is like inherently goofy, the fangs kind of almost cross inwards at a weird angle, he's pulling Ken Dodd face for the UK people out there, you know what I mean, um, and it's just, it's full on comedy, it's like it, it, like, it doesn't even attempt to be anything sinister, and as a result when this finishes, almost as if Robert Block is kind of like, you know what, I get it, the audience is like, huh? And he has the police officer say, I'm like, you're joking, right? Which is what I'm thinking when I watch this. Every single time I watch this. And um, I was like, no, 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 that's what happened. So the cop goes to investigate. And this is the end of the movie in the Lincoln story. Goes to investigate the house. Starts searching the house. And lo and behold, he's confronted and attacked by John Pertwee's funny, goofy looking vampire at the end. And uh, this r kind of ruins a lot of the hard work the movie has done for me. Um, I've recorded this review three times and through technical issues which I can't guarantee are not going to affect this video either. Um, my my grade has varied wildly from two to two and a half to three back to two and a half and I'm going to stick with three which is I liked it but on the scale of Amicus ones this is in the bottom half for me. This is a stretch to reach a three and realistically it's probably a two and a half. Um, the order is all over the place, the tone is all over the place by the end. Um, I don't understand what they were aiming for and actually, like I said before, it undoes some of the hard, serious stories delivered at the beginning. I could understand if there was maybe one or two and then the rest was comedy, but that one comedy shot is right at the end which doesn't make any sense. At least someone like a, a Mario Bava when doing like a Black Sabbath uh, and the Italian cut especially or something like a Bay of Blood leaves the very final shot as comedic to let the audience remember that it is, after all, only a movie they're watching. But it just, I don't know, I don't know. It's one of the reasons that, well, it's probably the primary reason it gets marked down for me and I've always felt that way, even from a kid I was kind of confused why that was the last story and how it ended up that way when the rest of the movie was trying so hard to be so serious why it ended up being so goofy at the end. Like I say, not a, a popular opinion. A lot of people love this one and I'm glad if you do. I hate to be in a world where everyone agrees on everything and someone creates something that no one likes. So, But I'm landing for a three on The House That Drip Blood. If you're checking us out on YouTube, please hit subscribe, please hit the like button, even if you disagree with my grade. And if you do disagree with my grade and you really like this one and it really works for you, write in the comments why. I'm always interested in hearing you guys' opinions. And like I said before, I ain't a 
proper movie critic. I have no qualifications. I just have a lot of free time and I enjoy doing these. So let's start the dialogue there and um, we'll keep that going. If you're checking us out on Spotify or Anchor using the video functionality there, there's a question that pops up at the end of all the episodes. Please answer that and also hit subscribe. That way you get the episodes as and when they drop. And if this is an audio podcast you're listening to, thank you very much for checking this out. Hit subscribe wherever you are catching this podcast. And that way you get the access to the over 1,200 episodes we've already released and everything we'll be putting out in the future. All that's left for me to say is we will be back to do the Beyond later on in the week and next Monday we'll be returning to Amicus Productions. But until then, wherever you are, what the time zone is and whatever you're up to in this big bad world of ours, please take care of yourselves out there. This is Duncan McLeish broadcasting live from under the stairs and I am signing off.